So today we're very pleased to have Darren Lestat here to talk about his research that he did for the master's degree in TESOL, uh, enacting voices, uh, looking at heteroglossic speech. And I know he's going to elaborate. Yeah. <laughs> Go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yep, so my name is Darren Lescott, and I'm going to talk about heteroglossic speech and kind of the differences I saw between enacting voices and recounting something in your own voice. Um, but it's not as complicated as it looks, I promise that. Um, I see a lot of I voted stickers, which I like. And if you don't, I promised myself I'd make a plug. Um, but if you don't have one, you probably have better <laughs> things to do than listen to me, jabber on. <laughs> so go vote. Yeah. Okay, um, so I want to give a brief introduction before I get into my study about what really frames, um, in my perspective, language learning and um, language use. And that um, comes out of the social turn in second language acquisition theory. So from the social turn, there's been a return to looking at the social dynamic of language use and also of language learning. So I have a quote here from Gass and Selenker. Um, that I think frames that pretty well. So language learning is linked to social and local ecology. It is adaptive to an emergent set of resources, resources that are embodied in social interaction. Learning is anchored in the social practices that a learner engages in, and linguistic utterances are sensitive to and reliant upon their interactional context. So for this study, um, social context and language production are inextricable inextricably linked, and so I'm not divorcing those from one another, um, just as I think you should not. So social context here is very important. Um, so going back a ways, um, in 1967, S.P. Quarter postulated that learners have this internal syllabus that guides their learning of a new linguistic system or a second language. And in 72, Larry Sanker said, okay, sure, but what's being acquired is not fully that targeted linguistic system because adults, according to him in his paper, Interlanguage, um, adults is anyone over the age of 12, um, but adults rarely fully acquire the second language that's being targeted, but what they do acquire a lot of the time falls in between that first language and second language on that spectrum, and so we term that Interlanguage. And what's come out of some of the sociolinguistic research studies is that just like languages um, vary depending on social context, who the speaker is speaking with and what the social situation is, so does interlanguage. So that's also very important for this study, looking at who the interlocutors are, so who the person is speaking with, as well as what the social situation is. Um, so framing my study, I wanted to highlight key three ones that came out. Um, from this information. So Leslie Beebe in 1980 found that Thai learners of English, when interacting with another ethnic Thai person um, who was actually conducting interviews with them, use more Thai-like variants in their phonology than they did when interacting with someone who is not from the same ethnic background. So here, the interlocutor having an effect on the phonology of the learners when speaking English. In 1995, Tyrone and Liu presented longitudinal research that documented acquisition um, of English, a five-year-old's acquisition of English over the course of two years. And there they showed that he would first use new linguistic structures with the family friend, then with his peers at school, and lastly with his teacher. So not only does interlocutor here have an effect on linguistic utterances and new linguistic structures, but it actually had an effect on his um, developmental sequences, so on his acquisition itself. And the, the last study I wanted to highlight is Maggie Bronner in 2001, who observed fifth grade em er, immersion students of, in Spanish, and she found that they drew differentially on their first language of English and Spanish depending on who they were speaking with and what that social situation was. So again, all of these indicating that interlocutor has a strong effect on language production, for the learner, um, as well as the social context. Um, but what I was looking at in my study, it involved change in kind of the social context, but it wasn't like these, um, where that change was in the external objective social context. So these changes that I was observing in my study were internal in the mind of the learner. So I um, wanted to bring in quickly another framework of sociocultural theory about how learners acquire language or how we internalize language. So um, sociocultural theory posits that 
the way we acquire um, higher order cognitive functions, of which we have language, is first through our social environment and through this process of mediation or sometimes referred to as play, um, we internalize these cognitive resources um, to become our own resources. Um, and so that started with Lev Vygotsky, an early 20th century Russian psychologist. And a contemporary of his in Russian social circles, uh, Mikhail Bakhtin, took this idea, agreed with it, and brought it a little step further um, and as he talked about heteroglossia. So just as first language would start in our social environment and through a process of interaction or mediation become internalized, um, he said that we have internalizing forces that work in our mind that pull in language, so kind of a regardless if we want it or not kind of thing. Um, but it doesn't just pull in the linguistic structures, just the bare bones of it, but actually they become embodied in their social context. So these are distinctive language varieties, um, which people have come to call voices in the mind of the learner. So not only are we pulling in the language from our surroundings, but the social context that embodies that language at that moment. So internalizing voices. Um, so by heteroglossia, I mean these distinctive language varieties that live in those authentic environments in the mind of the learner. Um, so this study really aims to kind of get at this overlap between sociocultural theory and sociolinguistic theory um, that I think hasn't really been explored in the literature before. So um, here specifically, I'm looking at how these voices have an impact. These voices that we've internalized have an impact on the learner's production um, through uh, as they kind of tell stories and interact with different interlocutors in their mind. So that brings me kind of my research question, um, just the one I have. If the complexity, accuracy, or fluency of two English language learners seem to differ when they enact the voice of a perceived interlocutor or perceived self versus when they recount a narrative. And I'm gonna unpack that a little bit um, too. So to get into my participants, um, I had two native speakers of French who were first year teachers in an immersion setting in Minnesota. Um, the first participant, Sylvie, was 24 at the time of data collection and had been studying English for the past 11 years. Um, she had a self-reported proficiency score of A2, um, that's in reference to the Common European Framework Reference for Languages, and if you line that up to our actual scale that we use here, um, that'd be about an intermediate low. So I didn't give a diagnostic for these participants, but in order to um, meet the requirements of the job that they had for this year in Minnesota, they had to take English placement kind of tests. Um, so these were within the year that I conducted the study. So recent, but nevertheless self-reported. The second um, participant, Marine, was 22 and had been studying English for the past nine years, so a little less time, um, and had a self-reported score of B1, or intermediate high. So even though she had been studying English for a lesser amount of time than Sylvie, um, she is our more proficient speaker of the two. So data collection took place in a small pub in Minnesota over <laughs> drinks, of course. Um, and the atmosphere was very informal and very casual. Um, they were not aware of what exactly I was looking at. What they were told when they consented to partake in the study was that I was looking at how learners interacted with one another and how that can inform on future teaching. Um, they knew I was doing this degree um, and MA in TESOL at the time, that I was also teaching at the university, so they were eager to help. Um, but were not informed that I was going to be looking at enacted voices, nor their narratives. Um, the prompt I had was very, very, very minimalistic, um, in that they could talk about anything that they wanted as long as, as it was in English. So they could talk about what they did that day, what they were going to do th during the weekend, if they missed their family at home, what their mom said to them the other day. Um, really anything that came to mind as long as it was, in, as it was in English. Um, I didn't give a very structured prompt because I wanted to elicit naturalistic data, and so I didn't want my prompts to inform on their speaking. Um, so it is very, very, very bare bones in comparison to other studies, um, but that's kind of what I was hoping to get out of it. So from that minimalistic prompt, I got 30 minutes of audio recorded data in which they um, made future plans, elicited and clarified information, and ended up telling stories about 
the kids in their classes, right, because they're teachers, and then the parents who are very active in their children's lives, um, just as teachers do. <laughs> Um, so that's what I'm really going to focus on for the data in my study is those narratives. And I know narratives, um, that's a specific field of research. And so a lot of times there's a lot of criteria to meet what actually is a narrative. Um, I'm going at the most foundational function of narrative. And I got that from Lebov and Wolatsky in 67. So what the foundational function of narrative is, is recapping personal experience, essentially, um, following the same sequence of events that happened, or the same temporal sequence. So for this study, narratives are recapitulating personal experience as an event or a sequence of event, of events, excuse me, including one or more characters and a central plot. Um, so a very foundational, um, basically just getting at stories, counting, or recounting stories to one another. And within those narratives, um, so from that data, I had the narratives. And then within those narratives, I identified what was enacted voice based on three criteria. And if you have a handout, this is actually the first three examples that are on your handout. If you don't have, I have a couple up here. Um, the first one, first criterion being direct quotation of another speaker marked with reporting verbs or quotative. So you can see, uh, if they do good things, uh, they receive uh, little things in uh, their bucket. And Carlos was like, oh, we could give them 20 of them. So that would mark a direct quotation from the quotative to be like. Um, I also marked direct quotation attributed to other speakers. Often this didn't have a reporting verb or a quotative, um, but was accompanied by a change in voice quality. So either the falsetto voice or a creaky voice or something to say that I'm taking on the character of someone else. Um, so for the, that example, we have Maureen telling a story about how this child got in trouble and because of you I won't have any electronic games for a week, so please don't send a note to my mom again. And Sophie, or Sylvie jumping in there saying, so please be nice in class. Right? So she's not a part of that story, she's not a part of that narrative, but she's attributing this voice to the teacher um, in that situation. And then also direct quotation of one's own voice through construction of a dialogue where the speaker is using dictics you or your or the imperative mood, but is no longer addressing her interlocutor at the other side of the table, right? So it's kind of in the story, living in that moment, dramatically presenting that dialogue still. And that comes at the last one. Um, and in this situation, apparently a lot of the parents um, like to drive the French interns around, so much so that Sylvie says, pay me for that, okay? Um, she's not telling Maureen to pay her for that, um, but kind of making a joke at how much um, people like that, I guess. <laughs> so those are my three different criteria for enacted voice. Um, I wasn't the only one that identified these. I actually had four interrators uh, listen to the audio recording. They had um, seen my criteria, and then they marked the transcript where they also perceived there to be enacted voice by these three different criteria. So all 24 segments that I had originally identified were confirmed by my interrogators. Um, so there are five different pairs of eyes on this, or eyes and ears, I should say, for enacted voice. Um, you'll notice those were all direct quotations. So some of you might be thinking of, what about indirect quotation or reporting speech? Um, and dr so drawing on Yule, I distinguish between direct quotation as enacted voice and indirect or reported speech as part of the narrative category. Because really, when you're indirectly quoting someone, it's more so your personal account of what was said. Um, so it takes on more of that narrative aspect. So um, this effect makes the indirect speech forms more like a narrative account of the event, distinctive from the dramatic, dramatic presentation of the event encoded in direct speech forms. So for this study, that dramatic presentation was equivalent to the enacted voice, whereas the reported speech or indirect quotation was part of that narrative category. So once I had my enacted voices segments and then uh, my narrative segments for both learners, I transcribed those and, oh, I had transcribed them before this, but they were transcribed and coded following um, Foster, Tonkin, and Wigglesworth AS unit or analysis of speech unit. And that's an independent clause or a subclausal unit. So if it's reduced, it can be built back up to be an independent clause together with any subordinate clauses. And that's important um, because that's what I use to base off my measures of complexity, accuracy, and fluency. 
um, looking at their um, learner language. So this is an example from table one. Um, she was really kind, one clause, one AS unit, versus when they are in red, we have a time clause followed by the main clause. They have a mail to the parents or yeah, something like that. So two clauses, one AS unit. Um, getting into how I measured each of these three, um, for complexity, I did a measure of grammatical complexity by subordination. Um, so going back to how I had distinction between clauses within AS units, I counted the total number of clauses and divided them by the total number of AS units to get at how complex their narratives were in comparison to their enacted voices. Um, so the higher the whole number resulting from that calculation, the more complex, grammatically complex your subordination the learner's speech was. For accuracy, I looked at it in two different ways. Um, the first was more of a holistic measure of accuracy. So again, with those clauses, I looked for error-free clauses. Um, so those that didn't have an error with preposition or with tense or marked for third person singular, um, really any kind of error. Um, so total number of error-free clauses over the total number of clauses within each respective category of an active voice and narrative um, to get a, a holistic accuracy percentage for each category. Um, I also looked at the types of errors that appear between the two. So um, my assumption at the beginning was that probably we're going to see similar errors in their narratives as well as the enacted voices. So these learners are going to make the errors um, across both. Um, but I wanted to look at where there are perhaps differences between. So there's also a form of error analysis between the two categories. And lastly, for fluency, um, I also did two different measures here. The first being um, temporal measurement, so of pausing. Um, so I looked at both um, filled pauses, so you have your ums, uh, uh, that kind of thing, and unfilled pauses, silence, um, within clauses. And um, I had a threshold of one second, so anything that passed one second was counted as a pause and the total number of pauses were um, added up and divided to get a mean pause length for each category. Um, so if that's for the breakdown fluency. And then I also looked at hesitation phenomena. So false starts, repetitions, reformulations, replacements. And the higher the ratio of hesitation to the number of clauses, the more disfluent the speaker was. So I looked at two different, or two different measurements for fluency there. Um, so going right into the results, I wanted to start with my most striking finding, which was an accuracy. So we're going to go a little bit out of order. Um, and so this is on your sheet as well for figure two. Um, so you can see the breakdown of narratives versus inactive voices um, for both Sylvie and Maureen. Um, so for the first one, for Sylvie, we see there's a, out of 139 clauses that constituted a narrative. Um, can I go up on this? I believe it's 93 if it's not going to... 91 clauses were identified to be error-free in our narrative category, which gave us a 65.5% accuracy percentage. Um, whereas 19 of her 22 inactive voice segments were error-free. Um, so an 86.4% accuracy rating for that. So there's a difference of 20.9%, so almost 21%. So it's a pretty um, large jump from narrative category to an active voice for Sylvie. Um, for Maureen, there is a very marginal difference, but actually goes in the opposite direction of 3% um, as she shifts down to her an active voice. And this is actually really interesting when you see what voices she's enacting and whose voices she's performing um, as she downshifts her proficiency for that. So I'll, get, I'll come back to that in just a little bit. Um, but basically, a large shift for the less proficient speaker, not so much for Maureen. Um, looking at the types of errors that were between narrative category and enacted voice, um, I saw a lot of things that were similar between the two, which is, I thought was expected. Um, but where there were differences and clear differences is what I thought was most interesting. So I have a few that I wanted to point out. So um, the French speakers in the room. <laughs> um, so this I think you might find interesting. So of nine times out of nine in the narrative category, um, Sylvie uses the word male 
and she doesn't do so with the French accent to be um, like a, a male, um, but she does it like male. Um, so it's not accented at all, but to mean email in each of these. So she's not, sent, she's not talking about sending letters through the postal service, but she's talking about emails um, in each of these. And so for each of these part of um, her narrative category, she's again talking to Marine, who's another French speaker. So arguably there's not a lot of, I mean, I'm sure Marine understood what she was talking about in each of these. So it wasn't very important for Sylvie to be correcting herself when she's talking through this. So 100% of the time, nine times out of nine, male, 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 all the way through. The one time that um, Sylvie correctly uses the word email is when she's recounting a story, talking to the mother of one of her students, um, who's not a French speaker, so a native speaker of English. And there it's important for her to use the word email, or perhaps to sound professional, professional um, as you see. So I gave her an answer two weeks later, like, oh, I didn't check my professional email, I'm a good teacher, don't worry. So in this context, it's important enough for Sylvie not to make that same mistake that she's been making with Maureen, because Maureen, she gets it, yeah, but maybe this mom would not understand what I'm saying. Or maybe that doesn't seem professional, or like a good teacher would make that mistake, what have you. But the only time that email appears in the entire transcription um, is in the enacted voice of Sylvie. And it does so correctly, okay? Um, another one that I saw a big difference in with Sylvie is um, so that darn third person singular S that we're always talking about, right? So um, every time she's supposed to be using third person singular S, um, she doesn't put it on. So base form, base form, base form, all the way through. So she does this many, many, many times. So I just pulled out three of them. Um, but he come from South America, Oh, that he never teach with the first grade or the way Victor managed the class. So never marked for inflection of third person singular. Um, the only time that she does mark um, for inflection of third person singular is when she's no longer herself, but enacting the voice of a father talking to a teacher. So here she's a native speaker of English. And you can see how that just leads up to it, um, riddled with just mistakes here and there and hesitation. but. Amon Jean said to me that told me that she received a mail of, of a father who asked her to say to his son that one of his toys were locked in a tree on their garden was now in her bedroom and he take the toys in the tree I don't know what and he just sent a mail to Amon Jean to say you can say to my son that he has now his toy. So <laughs> because that's what teacher that's the important thing for the class right that he has his toy back. Um, so that's the only time that's marked for third person inflection. Um, every other time in the obligatory context where it should be has, she uses have in other contexts. Um, so this is the only time that appears with has here and it's no longer when she's herself. So she's not telling the story anymore, but she's now that father talking to the teacher, the cooperating teacher in the classroom. Um, with Maureen, there was also a shift between the two categories when talking about accuracy. Um, however, it went in the opposite way. So if you remember back to when we saw a decrease in accuracy when she goes into her enacted voice, um, this is where this comes up. So um, she does a lot of eliciting information, more information from the stories with Sylvie as a more efficient speaker to get her to talk more, to get more information out of her. And so her question formulation, each time she does it, it's flawless. Um, and what do you think? Does it work well? Or, and so what do you want me to ask Jera? So here, she doesn't make mistakes with question formation. The only time that she does make a mistake ever with question formation is when she's no longer herself, but enacting the voice of someone who's less proficient. So we have um, Sylvie here telling a story of how someone ruined their big surprise Halloween costume, what they were gonna be. Um, this is about over, just over a year ago that I recorded this now. Um, so before Halloween, and someone spilled the beans that they were gonna be all the characters of Mario. And Victor and Clarice and me were like, Noah, it's a secret. And so Maureen jumps in there and attributes voice to whether that's Sylvia or whether it's someone else of that group that just got, you know, cats out of the bag. She says, why did you do? And then Sylvie takes back up, oh, I didn't know that. Now perhaps being Noah, uh, how it's possible. So yeah, finishing her story. So here, um, I don't think Maureen is making that conscious decision to stick it to Sylvie. Like, 
I'm more for, this is what you sound like, haha. -ha. Um, but it's, I think it's something that happens when people take on the voices of someone else because really it stays in that body social context. So here we just see a downshifting in proficiency um, when Maureen takes on the voice of someone who's less proficient. Um, getting into fluency, I saw a big increase in fluency. So this is um, the higher the number, the more disfluent here. So for Sylvie, there was a 2.2 second mean pause length in her narrative category. Um, and she didn't pause once in her enacted voices. So those came out um, just like that. Um, for Maureen, there was a 2.16 second mean pause length in her narrative category and technically a one second mean length. There was pausing, but it was all short. Um, for my study, the threshold is one second, so technically this would be incalculable, um, but I thought to include it because there is some instances of pausing, and I'm gonna show some in the transcripts later. But still, regardless, you see um, a large increase in fluency in terms of pausing for the two of them here. Um, looking at repair fluency or that hesitation phenomena, this first one is for Sylvie. Um, so we see there's 19 total instances in her narrative category, a lot of false starts, some repetitions as she's going through telling her stories, um, versus only one instance of a false start with her enacted voices. So it could be that these are in her mind, maybe they're more rehearsed, maybe she's told these stories before, um, of that I'm not sure, but it is clearly more fluent as she moves from one speech category to the next. Um, and you can see that I'm bringing back up the same example that I had before, um, just with this, but I won't even save me that told me that you receive of, of, of a father who asked her as she's struggling almost to kind of get her words out until she gets to that kind of punchline maybe that she's waiting for. And then it's, you can say to my son that he has now his toy. So a lot more fluent when in her enacted voice. For Maureen, um, there's, again, 19 instances, a lot of repetitions for her, some false starts, one replacement. Um, and then last, I mean, 19 to six, um, when you do ratios of how many clauses is to, these are actually very comparable. They're both around 22, 23% if you do ratios as a percentage. So really her um, hesitation stays the same between the two. Um, and you can kind of see that in this example here where I have her story leading up to an enacted voice. Um, where, and if the teachers forget to uh, check the, who is there and who is not there, she calls the phone in the classroom. Oh no, she, she makes an announcement. She says, Sophie, t uh, Sophie Crasher, please call the office. So there's still some hesitation, still some repeating as she's getting into her enacted voice, um, whether that's because maybe these stories are less rehearsed for her and Sylvie's a storyteller and has told these stories a million times, I'm not sure, um, but for Sylvie, we saw a big increase in both categories of fluency, and for Maureen, only in the aspect of pausing. For her breakdown fluency, it was still very comparable. And lastly, for complexity, um, this, uh, for grammatical complexity by subordination, there was a shift for both. Again, they're going in opposite directions. Um, Sylvie's more complex with her narratives than she is with her inactive voice. Um, Maureen goes in the opposite direction. Um, I think that it's more important that there is a shift between these categories than which way it goes, because as native speakers of a language, we use simple sentences, we use complex sentences. So it's not like we're always speaking in very um, redundant, overly complex academic sentences, um, the more proficient we are in a language. So um, I think it's more important to kind of look at how they're using these voices um, with regard to how they use narratives. And so I have two just different examples of how these two participants seem to be using their voices within their stories. So we have Maureen who kind of just quick intro, sets it up very briefly, and then lets the enacted voice kind of tell the story for her. Um, so for her, the enacted voice maybe is the story here, the most important part. Whereas Again, with Sylvie, you see her taking more time to give contextual information, more background information, and then uses those enacted voices as kind of those key punchlines at the end to highlight um, the dramatic, can you believe he said that? Um, this goes on, this is the first time you can see what she says after that, and a response to, you can say to my son that he has now his toy, her response, like we are at school, I receive a ton of mail in a day, I don't have time for that, you can maybe wait until the end of the day. 
So um, kind of key things that I'm pulling out from the results um, are some implications potentially for SLA theory and others for second language learning and teaching practice. Um, so the first, I believe that these findings support a variationist position that inner language variation in social context has an effect on acquisition. So we're seeing that um, regardless of whether or not the learners are able to use certain things in their own voice or in the narrative category, they have that information embedded in a voice somewhere internally in their mind. So whether we're seeing kind of the initial start of their acquisition of third person singular S and they're only confident enough or subconsciously able to use it when they're taking on the voice of someone else versus when they're themselves, I'm not sure, but it's in the mind of the learner, right? So um, because during this entire recording, we had the same two learners talking across the table from one another, the social environment didn't change, interlocutors didn't change. What did change were the perceived interlocutors in the story, kind of who they were talking for and who they were talking to. So these were um, internal to the mind of the learner. So must have been acquired sometime before then and we're just kind of seeing the initial stages of it transferring over to their own voice. Um, so that would contradict previous studies that claim that social context is solely performance variable and that doesn't have an effect on acquisition. Um, for teaching implications, um, so already I think everyone here can attest that we do this. We use other people's voices to tell stories. We kind of take on these other characters for our own social or generic functional purposes. And we do this as much in our first languages as we do those that we acquire um, enough proficiency to do so later on. Um, so instead of letting this kind of just naturally occur and every once in a while, oh yeah, isn't that funny how this happens? Um, I think teachers should be able to harness this and bring it into the classroom to use it to have an effect on their learner's interlanguage to further develop it. So um, really what the saying is more of a call for theatrics in the classroom. So doing more role plays for students when they're no longer um, Bob, but now they're someone who's more proficient and they're able to take on those voices that they're not confident enough to use themselves. Or acting out scenes from a film, show, or play, or perhaps even dramatizing readings in the classroom. So this could allow for learners to take on these more proficient chunks of language um, and then internalize these in their own heteroglossic language repertoire and later trickle on down into their own language. And this could, so what I'm seeing is this has an impact on vocabulary, so lexical as well as grammar. Um, but other studies have looked at this as well and shown that it could also have an impact on pronunciation, intonation, and prosody. So our own Colleen Myers in the ITA program does a very similar study, um, or I guess activity or task with her students where she has them mirror a more proficient speaker. Um, and that kind of trickles on down or the latest study that Leo Moreno just finished um, and should be in a conservancy soon, hopefully. Um, I was trying to look for it. But um, that could have an effect on learners um, more target-like intonation and prosody as well. So those are my two cents on this. Um, I'd be interested to hear what you have to say, um, but that's all I have prepared. So these are the references in case you're interested in kind of going to the original sources of them. Um, otherwise, um, if you have questions or anything to add, I don't know. That's it. Thank you. Hi, Elaine. Yes. Um, so it's a, it's a big assumption that one that needs to be studied that this affects, that it does, that what you're able to perform when you're being somebody else actually becomes part of your own voice over time. Like you're saying, I think it will. Right, I don't have longitude, no, yeah. But, but I'm not sure there's evidence yet that that happens. Any thoughts about that? Well, um, there isn't longitudinal evidence. I know um, Leah Moreno, for hers, she was looking at how this affects on intonation and prosody. And as um, her participant kind of acquired these different voices and was able to kind of enact them down the line, um, it was more target-like. And even though he was using his own voice, when it was stimulated recall, she's like, oh, can you listen to this and tell me why this is more, 
And he's like, oh, you know, that sounds like my pal Charlie, I think the name was. So um, that's an interesting study of how, even though he's speaking for himself and using his own voice, it, he could hear the voice of someone else the way he was saying a certain thing or phrasing something. Um, so that's the only one I've heard of. I don't know if Colleen Myers has documented past her one semester. Um, Yeah, I, have the, I was looking for it um, earlier, but it, it seems like it's not up there yet. To be determined or TBD. Eric? I think even when a study like this, there's a lot, there are a lot of reasons for using theater and teaching language. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious about whether anyone knows about anything that goes on. I mean, every time a new course comes up, it's in our format, it's English for engineers or English for. Yeah. So I will offer one example of that mm -hmm. currently ongoing in the French department. Um, Mary Franklin Brown is offering a course called Gateways, and part of it is a uh, role play of the, the causes and origins of the French Revolution. The students take on various factions and roles, and then they have to go research what motivates and inspires this, and then they have structured um, interactions in class, and they try to resolve together some point of contention based on who their assigned role is in the target language, in this case French. And this is something that they've adopted from, do you remember where, Princeton? Or I'm not sure. There was another university that piloted this, this idea, and we've adopted it here, and um, she's trying for the first time this semester. So we'll see how the students respond. Do they have uh, access to actors or someone speaking oh, to They have access to, as far as I know, access to printed information and whatever they find in their own research. I'm not sure how much they're finding media and video and such that would give them examples of, you know, native speaker who is portraying Robespierre or something like that. I'm not sure. It'd be interesting to see if our students yeah. are looking on YouTube to find their resources or if they're in books. I always feel that, that movies or popular culture movies are sources of models for some learners. I, I, I'm remembering a student I had back at the University of Washington, a woman from Brazil, who sounded and walked like John Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> it was very odd. <laughs> um, but I, I just wonder if there might be, because what Colleen is doing is saying, choose a role model that you want to sound like, and then become that person, and move like that person, talk with that accent. Um, but how, whether that, they can imitate it is mm -hmm. what happens, but does it, does it continue when they're teaching accounting? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. That's mm -hmm. There's a lot of I mean, you often hear people say, I learned English through songs. Yes. Or I learned English through mm -hmm. uh, friends mm -hmm. yeah. on TV. Mm -hmm. Something I've always been skeptical of, but there probably was enough to it. Then. I think there are very casual ways in our language courses that we do role playing, like if we're reading a text with a lot of dialogue. <coughs> yeah. That, but it's very casual. It isn't like targeted in that way. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it could be, and it's varies with instructors if they're going to do all of that kind of thing. Right. But there are students who really embrace this idea of mimic and imitation. I mean, I've had this student in 3015 who just, you know, he's like, I go to France, people think I'm French because he's caught up in the role. Mm -hmm. oh. the, in, you know, he has the intonation, yeah. and it's kind of remarkable because, you know, he's not, his parents aren't French. He's, he, I don't know, he just, it's, when, when you get caught up in the role, sometimes it's a very useful thing. Yeah, this is also anecdotal, um, but it's a story I heard on NPR of Emily Blunt, the actress, mm -hmm. um, who stuttered. She couldn't make it through a sentence without stuttering. Um, and her teacher, when she was eight or nine, told her to try out for the school play. And so she did, and she was a woman from the north. Um, and so when she took on that role and became that woman, she didn't stutter throughout 
the entire play. Mm -hmm. So then she got into acting, and now she's, well, she's a famous actress, but, um, but that helped her through her stuttering. So I think there is um, value in kind of taking on these roles and kind of yeah, characters. Like Yeah, so it's identity, yeah. yeah. Okay. There's also the difference between taking a role and you know, being a member of art or whatever and actually delivering the lines that, you know, uh, Edward Alvey wrote, or you know, something like that. He actually delivered a script. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, I don't know how significant that is, but there are a lot of little pieces of these that are mm -hmm. all worthy of consideration. Yeah. That's what Teresa and I wanted you to do last time. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So basically, um, the variationist view being against this. Or where am I going? Is this one? No. Here we go. So, um, variationist view saying that social context has an effect on acquisition, um, and it's not a merely a performance variable. So um, this goes back to Long's claim. Um, where it was just a performance variable. So it affects you maybe when you're trying to give a performance or give a presentation in front of the class, but that, that's not affect on your acquisition of something that's just like you're intimidated by social factors. Um, whereas this, I think, shows that because these are internal to the mind of the learner and they're able to perform a certain way where there's no change in the objective social context. Um, so it's kind of like the, the idea of um, different competencies or different uh, like grammars in your mind, one being these other people's grammars and one being your own. So these are acquired some, I mean, they were acquired previously and able to kind of bring out these voices. Um, so I think that this at least depicts the initial beginning of acquisition. Um, if what you kind of define acquisition as being able to use it in your own voice, this is probably where it starts at least. So I need more kind of longitudinal research to see like it now is in their own voice and this was the start and now it does have an effect but I think this kind of offers support whether they want it they can take it <laughs> or not but I think um, it kind of demonstrates that because the outside doesn't change. Yeah. David? I was wondering if you looked at the use of quotations at all as a form of avoidance because it's hard for me not to think as a grammar teacher about how much more difficult it would be as reported speech to say some of those things or say, like, pay, pay me for that, please, you know, versus I told them that they needed to pay me for that. Like, All right. Um, that could be a reason why it's less grammatically complex. Um, it wasn't like the less proficient speaker used more an active voice than the other did. Um, but that's an interesting theory of like taking someone else's words, kind of like how you see a lot with quotations with um, writing students, mm -hmm. where they're kind of taking someone else's more proficient words and using them versus paraphrasing or using their own. I think native speakers of a certain generation do this a lot, and they don't use indirect speech, or, or they don't. 
I mean, I just think to say it's avoidance would suggest that if you have full proficiency in English, say you're a native speaker, that of course you would use all the that you should. But with that, when you're in the middle of telling a story like this and you're a college student, you enact it. That's how it works. Uh, I was just thinking about it from the perspective of our students in Melbourne are able to quote way right before they can sure. use reported speech. Mm -hmm. Reported speech, you could argue, is. I probably don't have enough data to say that's avoidance or that's not, because with other examples, you really have Sylvie struggling to kind of get to like where she can use enacted voices, where the more proficient speaker is using them to kind of tell the entire story. So I feel like it'd be the opposite if it was avoidance, almost. But in that second example, the first line is, is in direct speech. She saved me that, she, she told me that. She right. Yep, so, but this is our less proficient speaker, so I feel like these would be switched if that was the case. Uh -huh. Like, the less proficient speaker would be using all direct quotation, um, kind of like this. But a lot of, so it kind of totaled up to being very similar in enacted voices between the two, um, but for the complexity, it would seem more like letting some tell the story for the whole thing and the other person kind of using it as highlighting punchlines. But yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Yeah.